Thank you very much for uh, coming today. And uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me again it's for the third year in a row. Uh, I don't know if that will continue like this. Probably I will be banned after this lecture. Let's see. Um, I don't know if Arto included the option of answering boring <laughs> because of, of uh, the kind of lecture that I'm going to give right now. But yeah, there's some risk that you will think that summer schools are boring after this. No, now I've been serious about that. Um, this has been a very nice introductory talk. And um, uh, what we are going to see in this lecture are some concepts that are closely re related to what Arto said, especially about Bayesian inference and how to compute the posterior distribution and also how does it really handle uncertainty uh, how does the concept of posterior distribution handle uncertainty and also uh, i'll try to show some examples during the lectures that uh, so that it's not as boring as it could be let's see but uh, first of all uh, i would like to say that um, while i was traveling from spain to Helsinki. It was a long trip, a long flight, and then I thought about many things. And one of them was that probably all of you were born after uh, machine learning started and uh, after many things started. So probably some of the, some of the things that I'm going to say here uh, might look like uh, old people or old school things to you just because you are very young. Uh, which is also quite exciting to see how uh, you can be so clever. You are so clever and you have so much knowledge being so young. It's probably because uh, we, the old guys here, are really getting old. Um, but uh, one thing is that, well, a very important thing, going back to the beginning of my career when I started my PhD, uh, was uh, an, to make an important decision. So... I, I was uh, willing to, to do a PhD on artificial intelligence. But uh, one of the things that we had to decide were, was to go probabilistic or not go probabilistic in the sense of, is this really probability the tool that we should use in artificial intelligence? And that was an important issue. It, it, it seems that all of you have already decided you go probabilistic. But uh, it was a decision that we had to make to, to make beforehand. So the question back in the, uh, I'm speaking about the early 90s, was that uh, what kind of uh, imprecision, uncertainty are you going to target in your PhD? Is it going to be uncertainty? And we will speak about uncertainty or mainly the two kinds of uncertainty that we can face uh, usually in artificial intelligence problems. Or is it also imprecision or uh, vagueness, uh, what you really want to handle. Because depending on what you really want to handle, then probability can be the appropriate tool, and I believe it's the appropriate tool for handling uncertainty. But there can be other, other uh, limitations of data or some particularities in your problem that may require some other tools. Uh, for instance, if you have imprecise data or insufficient data to specify a probability distribution, then maybe some other kind of uncertainty uh, measures could be used, but now all of you are focused or focused on or are focusing on uh, uh, probabilistic models, and that's uh, it is actually what we are going to explore during the next during the next two hours. Um, and perhaps the motivation. Uh, I always like to start with this slide. Yes, uh, you might think I'm a geek. Uh, you're probably right. Um, uh, I like chess, and uh, I, I, I don't know if you remember, it was a couple of, or three years ago, I don't remember, after the pandemic, all the one is losing consciousness about the time. But some years ago, when uh, Google uh, issues the uh, Alpha Zero algorithm that was able to train itself to play chess and actually managed to beat all computer chess programs uh, uh, existing back then, then this guy, uh, Peter Nielsen, who uh, is a professional Danish chess player and who was a member of the, uh, of the training team for Magnus Carlsen, the current world champion, he said what is written there, I always wonder how it would, it would be if someone 
from a superior species landed on Earth and played chess and told us uh, how they played chess. So uh, he said, now I know it. It was a deep neural network playing chess. The deep neural network was the alien coming from uh, another world and playing chess and beating all of us. Uh, but we uh, know how it works. But the question is, have we learned anything from that? Or are we able to learn anything from the way a deep neural network play chess? And uh, when I say, can we, I mean, can chess players really learn from that way of playing chess? Uh, and what I want to say is, if we use a very efficient uh, predictive models, and in this case, uh, the prediction could be the next move to make, then the thing is, are, are we really understanding what the model is doing? Because if it's to play chess, then uh, we can just trust the suggestion of the computer and do the move. In the worst case, we will uh, lose the game or we will win the game not knowing why. But assume that we are deciding on a, on a treatment on a patient, then if we don't really know what is uh, underneath the system that is suggesting that, that we took a treatment or another, then uh, we could have a problem, especially if, if the treatment fails. So uh, in some sense, uh, it's important that we understand what artificial intelligence is doing. And I think that's one of the main uh, uh, good features of probabilistic models, that they can be understood, at least to some extent, can be understood by people, uh, even by people who doesn't have a deep mathematical knowledge. So uh, uh, I will try to also uh, show during the le this lecture how probabilistic models and especially uh, some particular kind of probabilistic models can really be interpreted by humans and so that uh, be more useful in that sense. So, Arto already uh, mentioned some applications of probabilistic models. I will describe uh, or just mention for uh, motivation purposes some uh, already existing applications of probabilistic models in the market, let's say, or in the real world. One of these is about uh, soccer, about football. And uh, it is a software that uh, allows to predict when a player is going to be uh, or is going to have a high risk of uh, being injured due to uh, too much training or whatever. So uh, this is a software that was made by a Spanish company, but it's used uh, by teams uh, all over the world. And uh, it is based on a probabilistic models that try to measure, to measure the uncertainty about the player being injured using a probabilistic model, as I said. Um, another very uh, typical example of probabilistic models is, uh, or comes from the world of uh, self-driving cars, where you have to decide about a lot of things. You have a lot of inputs and you have to make uh, make up your mind about what to do, where to break, whether to continue, whether to turn, uh, whether to accelerate. Well, there are many things that you have to, to decide uh, as a response to many uh, a lot of input data. So, uh, of course, uh, there's always uncertainty about the decision that you're making. And uh, usually, this is made, uh, these decisions are made using probabilistic models. Why? Because by doing that, you are able, you are able to control the probability that you are making a wrong decision, so that you can evaluate the cost and take the decision that is optimal in, sen in the sense of uh, minimizing some given cost or maximizing some uh, kind of profit. Uh, there's also uh, art to mention the uh, variational autoencoder for generating images, and actually uh, there's a recent application by Google again. Um, I don't know if you know it. Uh, I don't know the right pronunciation, imaging or something like that. Was like an image generator where you can describe using a, a top-level language uh, an image, and then you get a picture, an image, uh, trying to fit your written description. So what is underneath this system is a, what is called a probabilistic model, but more precisely a generative model. So it's a probabilistic model, I will explain it later, that is able to generate new examples 
out of the model. So uh, somehow tries to, out of the description that, that you give, tries to generate an image. But what is important is to say that this is an image that doesn't exist previously. So it is like sampling a new image trying to uh, fit your description. So that's something that probabilistic models can usually do. Um, I also wanted to put uh, an example of uh, something that is closer to me. This is an application that we use where we try to predict the land use in uh, the region of Spain where I live, which is Andalusia in the south the southern part of Spain, and then taking, taking a sample of uh, satellite images and some other variables uh, that were describing the kind of use of the, of the land, especially we were interested in the, the, how the land is used in natural parks. Then you can describe or try to predict how the land is going to be used, but also try to uh, assess how the land is being used in points where you don't, have, you don't really have information. Again, we have the concept that we are able to generate new data, new data points out of the models that we are constructing. So that's an important, quite important feature of probabilistic models. So if we try to sum up what we have seen uh, so far, we can find that all these uh, examples operating uh, environment where it is true, there are large amounts of data available. But it doesn't matter how much data we have. It doesn't matter how big data is, because uh, usually data won't cover all the possible scenarios that we can, uh, we can face. So that's why uh, we always, or we generally have uncertainty associated with, with everything that we are doing in probabilistic artificial intelligence. Uh, all of the systems that I have described, all of the examples, use a, an underlying probabilistic model and use inference algorithms to predict what is going to happen or what is happening in, in places where no information is available. And also, probabilistic inference is used to, uh, what I wrote here is structure analysis in the sense of uh, analyzing what is influencing what other things. So what variables are relevant for what other variables that we can learn, for instance, if we are trying to decide on the treatment or uh, for some disease, disease uh, whether the doctor can learn, okay, this is the temperature and it is really uh, influencing the, I don't know, blood pressure. I, I have no idea about medicine or whatever. But the thing is that we can carry out this kind of structural analysis as well. What do probabilistic models offer? Do they satisfy all the conditions necessary to meet the requirements on top of the, on top of the slide? Well, we will see that uh, probabilistic model really offer principled uncertainty quantification. But also, they, they, they offer a natural way of handling uh, missing data. So kind of working when you still don't have uh, your database fully specified. It can be that you have entire columns, let's say entire variables that are not observed at all. It could also be only that you have some missing cells in your data set. But also, uh, and perhaps more importantly, especially uh, currently where exp explainable artificial intelligence is really playing a key role in all research and all applications, uh, probabilistic models are interpretable. Oh, this is, uh, maybe this slide is, uh, as, as I was uh, looking at the slide again in, uh, on the plane, this is maybe the slide that made me think that you are maybe too young for this because <laughs> using a paragraph taken from Tom Mitchell's book that dates back to 1997. So uh, yeah, I bet most of you weren't even born. But probably you know the, uh, the, the book about uh, by Tom, Tom Mitchell, Machine Learning. And uh, as Arto said, well, machine, probabilistic machine learning is perhaps the most important uh, application of probabilistic uh, models in artificial intelligence. But the first thing we should think about is what is really machine learning? So let's go back to the original definition. And Tom Mitchell defined uh, machine learning uh, like this. He spoke about a computer program. Okay, it does not necessarily be a computer program. It can be a model that, of course, will be implemented in a computer. But he spoke about a computer program, program that is able uh, to learn from experience E. 
So that's machine learning. What does it mean that it's able to learn from some kind of experience? Well, that uh, if we have some measure of performance regarding that uh, the task that the, the, the program uh, is able to do. So if the program is able to improve the performance measure on solving the task that the program is meant to solve, uh, after having the experience, then we say that, that uh, that's a machine learning program, okay? So we might wonder what is really machine learning in what we are going to do uh, in predictive models or whatever. And in order to illustrate that, uh, I decided to use a very easy example, linear regression. So Art also spoke about regression in the introductory, introductory presentation. So you might wonder, is it really true that you guys only know about regression? So the question can be yes. <laughs> uh, but there's also uh, the, the, the answer could be yes, but there's also an even worse answer that would be no, we don't even know about regression. So that would be even worse. Was so yeah, uh, regression. But th this is even more simple that one. Uh, where Arto used a, a not so simple model. I will use even a regression for dummies model. Uh, and actually, this lecture could be Art Arto's lecture, but for dummies. So, but <laughs> uh, yes, yeah. We, there, there are other lectures over there, and you have a whole week to do the difficult things. So let's concentrate on the e easy things during this lecture. So that so. But the question is, I think it's important that we uh, ask ourselves, is it really a machine learning model? Because if you go to uh, machine learning papers and applications, many of them use linear regression. So uh, let's start with, from the uh, most simple uh, setting that we can analyze is that we only have two variables and we want to predict one variable from the value of the other variable. So we have X and Y and we want to predict Y from the value of X. And we assume that the relationship between both variables is just a line. It's a linear uh, relationship like the one that I have uh, put on the slide. So y is one constant a plus another constant b times x. That very simple model. So the goal of uh, the learning algorithm here would be just to find the value of parameters a and b but find the values according to some performance measure we are trying to see if this is machine learning. So we are trying to see what is the performance measure, what is the task that we want to solve. We want to solve. So the task that we want to solve is just predicting the value of y. And the performance measure could be the root mean square error, for instance. Just somehow measuring the differences between the predicted values for variable y and the true values for, for that variable. Yeah, of course, we raised to the power of two just in order to avoid uh, that negative differences compensate with positive differences. And anyone knows why do we take the square root? Yeah, it's just, uh, well, why am I saying that? Yes, because I'm getting old, but I remember that formerly in Spain, in order, when you became a social professor, there was an exam after, uh, after that uh, assessment committee. And one of the guys in the committee asked me about this. So I was kind of surprised. This is uh, first day statistics course in the first semester of the, okay. No, no, but I, I just, uh, well, one reason could be just to have the same unit in the error as in the variable, but it's, it was just a old school thing. So the question is, is this really machine learning? Is this really machine learning? What do you think? With this setting, we have uh, uh, a task to do, which is predicting the value of y. We have a performance measure. We have experience. Experience is the data set we are learning from. So is this really machine learning? So we can try to find out by running the example on our computers. And that's uh, what I've tried to do here. Uh, so you probably have uh, access to these notebooks where, well, um, they are done in Python. And uh, if, if you explore the, the notebooks, you, you will see that there are some parts that are really good code. Those parts I stole them from Stack uh, Overflow. 
And then the bad parts are the ones that I coded myself. So, so just uh, let's try to see if this well is this work. It was because I've done beforehand. So uh, what I'm doing here is just to generate randomly values of x uniformly uh, in the interval minus three to three. I generated a thousand. Uh, values and then what i what i'm going to do is to learn a regression model and here i'm generating sorry the values for y which is just uh, two times x plus three so a is equal to three and uh, uh, b is equal to two and then i'm adding some uh, random noise which comes from a sam randomly sample from a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation equal to two okay so I'm actually generating some points and I'm trying to feed a regression model out of it. How I'm trying to feed it, just using the typical least square approximation for computing the, the parameters, the values of the parameters, uh, the estimate of the parameters in the regression model. So uh, this is what I'm trying to do here, but I'm going to do it using different sample sizes. So first of all, I will construct, I will learn a model using only two data points then another one using four data points, six, 10, 100, 500, and 1,000. And let us see what, is, uh, what we are obtaining there. So what I'm doing here is exactly that. So what's going on here? For some reason, the scatter plot is only covering, let's see. Well, I don't know why, but uh, this is, uh, I mean, the, the, the right part is uh, then stolen from uh, stack uh, overflow, and this is what I encoded. You know? I don't know why you, I can't see the points here, but they should be, and probably uh, if you run the the notebook from your computer, and then you will, you will see all the points here. But we have something similar to this. And uh, in, in any case, let's generate them again, just to be sure. OK. Well, now it works. So uh, now we have uh, all the points that I generated between minus 3 and 3. And uh, we have uh, very thin lines. The first one, the black one is uh, built only using two data points, the red with four data points and so on, until the brown one, which is the one that is built using all the, all the data sample, the 1,000 points. And as you can see, the red one, I mean, well, this is also red as well, but no, 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 maybe not the red. The, the, the red that I mean is this one. Uh, no. Yes, this is the second. The first one is this black. As, as you can see, the, the one with only two data points is a very bad fit. Okay. But then it is uh, getting better, not the red one, red one with four data points. But as you increase the number of data points, you see that you are getting better estimates of the linear model. So in that sense, it seems that the model is actually learning after the experience. So. I think uh, we could consider this linear uh, regression model as a machine learning model, okay? Uh, and finally, what we get is something like this. But uh, I also may, may mentioned the, mentioned the uh, performance measure. We use a root mean square error. And this is what we get if we plot the root mean square error for all the data samples that we use. This is a, uh, this thin red line that is doing worse than the, than the previous one, but it can happen. And it actually, it will happen in all your career when you're doing experiments, you'll find something like this. But uh, in the long term, that you see how the root mean square error is really going down. So it really looks like this is a machine learning model that is learning from experience, OK? So yes, we have been able to build a very simple machine learning. Now we know how to do machine learning. <laughs> yes.
but it, this is a nice achievement, isn't it? Uh, but now we, uh, it, can, uh, it cannot be worse. I mean, you can only learn more difficult things uh, starting from this. But we have to be uh, very careful because we are in a probabilistic artificial intelligence school, and there's nothing about probability in this model that I built. I only use probability to randomly generate the sample, but not for building the model. Uh, by the end of the lecture, by the end of the lecture, we will be able to, to see that this problem can be also formulated from a probabilistic perspective, so that the linear regression model can be uh, defined as a probabilistic model too, and solved using a unified way of solving problems, which is uh, what Arto, uh, Arto, Arto mentioned in the previous slide, by using Bayesian inference. Um, so let's go to speak, uh, let, let's speak now about the kind of uncertainty that we will be able to handle using probabilistic models. You guys are all uh, at least starting a PhD or some of you uh, are postdocs or come from industry. So uh, you have ha already have some contact with uncertainty and ways of handling uncertainty. And you have probably heard about the two types of uncertainty that uh, usually uh, can be found in machine learning in artificial intelligence application, which is the uh, aleatory uncertainty and the epistemic uncertainty. So the first one, the aleatory uncertainty, is the one that is due to pure randomness. We, we, I, I'll explain now uh, what it is. Uh, while the other one, epistemic, uh, is usually due to the lack of knowledge. So uh, if we, for example, assume that, again, we want to predict variable y from variable x, but instead of building a linear regression model, what we do now is to learn a joint probability distribution for both of them. And then out of the joint distribution, we can compute the conditional of y given x. This is just the definition of conditional probability. So we are using the joint distribution and the marginal on x to compute the conditional of y given x. And we can use uh, this conditional distribution to predict the uh, value of y. And then I would like to ask you, and if you, how could we do that? Uh, think about the problem that we have solved using linear regression. Using linear regression, we fitted a line. So if we had one value of x, we, can, we could just uh, project the value on the line and then project again to, uh, over, the, over the y axis and find a value for y. Okay, it's very simple. But how could we predict a value for y if instead of a line, what we have is a conditional distribution given x? What would you do? to predict the value of y. Assume we have a precise value, for instance, x is equal to 1.5. What is the value of y, or how can, we how can we compute a value for y if we have a conditional distribution here instead of a line? Could be the mean of the conditional distribution. Very good. Sample, take a sample. You could take a sample and then what would you do with the sample? But that's a, a very important question, a very important uh, issue. You said that uh, you took a, you can take a sample. That's very correct. That's the, the, the answer that I wanted to hear because it, it means that there's some uncertainty associated to the process. Even if we know perfectly what the, the joint distribution is and therefore we know perfectly the specification of the conditional distribution, if we try to predict the value of y, then it might be possible that we obtain different values in different attempts, okay? Because there are some, ran some uh, uh, randomness associated to the specification that we are using. So we are using a conditional probability distribution and then uh, there's some randomness associated to the process. So, and that's a kind of randomness that we cannot get rid of. Uh, this is the aleatoric uncertainty. However, the randomness that would uh, uh, occur because the specification of the dis joint distribution is not good enough can be reduced. So in that sense, the uh, epistemic uncertainty is kind of reducible, while 
the other one is irreducible. Okay, so very good answer in that sense. So how can we reduce uncertainty? Well, we will see how Bayesian, uh, Bayesian uh, inference works with reducing uncertainty. But just very quickly, uh, the way of reducing ep epistemic uncertainty, one very clear way of doing that would be to have more data because then we will have a better estimate of the joint distribution and, and, and then uh, less uncertainty in that sense. But there are also uh, some other ways of uh, reducing uncertainty, or not, not, not uh, reducing uncertainty, but there are different sources of uncertainty. And one source can be also kind of, we could say, misspecification of the model. So assume uh, what we want to do with our model is to predict a value for, uh, we want to predict the class, let's, let's think uh, that uh, y now is a discrete variable. So we want to predict, predict the value of y. There are two possible values uh, from the value of variable x1. And if we do that, what we get is uh, something like this. We have items that belong to class 1, which is a red dot, and items that belong to class b, which is the x, the cross, and some of them overlap if we take into account the, the value of x1. So there's some kind of uncertainty here as well. So, but that uncertainty can be due not to, not to the lack of data, but can be just a problem of not having specified the model properly. Because it might happen that instead of one single feature variable, we would uh, require two uh, feature variables. What I've done here is just to plot the, exactly the same data, but in two dimensions. Or, or actually, what I do was the other way around. I took this uh, plot, and then I projected all the crosses and, and points over the, the x axis, right? So just having the appropriate number of features can also reduce the uncertainty. Problem is that we, there's something that we cannot uh, usually decide. I mean, all, we have all the data that we have. We cannot have new, more data than this, but we have to be aware that it is also a source of uncertainty. And uh, OK, so. Uh, just to sum up, what, what we have learned so far is what is a machine learning model, what kind of uncertainty we are going to face in artificial intelligence, um, and uh, also uh, we also spoke about what are the requirements for a, a probabilistic model. And what, what we will see now is that we will use some particular kinds of probabilistic models, the so-called probabilistic graphical models that have some adventure, uh, some advantages in what, uh, when it comes to applying them to artificial intelligence or machine learning problems. A probabilistic graphical model is just a probabilistic model, so a probability distribution after all, but who is somehow structured. So the relationship between the variables in that probability distribution can be somehow encoded by a graph structure. So that structure is uh, actually helping us to define efficient algorithms for carrying out inference and learning, but also is helping us in explaining what are the relationship between those variables. So the model that we are building, if it is a probabilistic graphical model, will be easier to understand for a human uh, user than if we just learn a probability distribution or whatever, a joint probability distribution over a, th a thousand variables without giving any explicit information about the structure inside, inside it. So what we really need, uh, as Arto mentioned uh, in the introductory talk, is efficient ways of doing things. Especially, we are speaking about high dimensional spaces. Uh, when I say high dimensional spaces, I mean just a lot of variables. We have a lot of variables, and we need, we need efficient algorithms for making predictions and efficient algorithms for estimating the parameters of the model. So what probabilistic graphical models offer is precisely that. The specification is structured, so we can specify our very difficult multivariate model as a set of much smaller models. So the problem is simplified in that sense. We are locally specifying the models, and in the end, we get a spec full specification for the joint model. And that structure specification allows for efficient inference because there are algorithms that take advantage of the structure of the model. 
And also, as I said, the graphical representation is understandable by humans. And we will see how a uh, probabilistic graphical model can be easily interpreted because, in fact, is uh, as we were playing with uh, Lego pieces, any probabilistic graphical model can be built, any one that you can think about, can be built using only three different kinds of Lego pieces, connecting them all together. So you only know how, need to know, you only need to know how to understand each one of the three pieces. So if you know this piece means that this is happening, this other Lego piece means that some other thing is happening. So you have all of them together. So when you see the full picture, when you see the full picture, you say, okay, this is happening because I have this legal piece here that is connected with this other legal piece. And then anyone who has no notion at all about mathematics can at least have an idea of what is happening with the model that we have built from data. Okay. So, uh, and where do really probabilistic graphical models uh, play a role in the, all the artificial intelligence or data analysis or machine learning process. Well, then uh, I also stole this uh, slide from, in this case, from uh, one paper, one presentation by David Bly, which is perhaps one of, one of the most renowned contributors to mach probabilistic machine learning. And um, uh, he spoke about the probabilistic modeling cycle, which is, if you think about the, uh, let's say, scientific way of doing things uh, or the experimental way of validating hypo hypothesis, just that, just that, okay? So uh, what we have is that usually when we learn a model from data, first of all, with, uh, we hypothesize which model will solve our problem. Then by using the data, we infer some uh, quantities, or some parameters about the model, and then we criticize or we test the model using some part of the data that we had in order to validate it. Then after the validation, we can revise it and improve it. And uh, the role that PGNs play in these parties as the model that we are hypothesizing uh, that could solve uh, our problem, okay? So uh, let's go to the fundamentals of uh, learning a model from data from a statistical point of view. As Arto mentioned before, there are basically two ways of doing this. They say uh, one is the classical or the frequentist approach, which is based on the likelihood function. And then we have the Bayesian way of doing uh, the parameter estimation, which is using actually more information, as we will see. But let's start from the beginning because uh, we need to know why Bayesian statistics is actually required. In order to know that, then it's good to uh, understand what was done before Bayesian, before Bayesian analysis. So uh, the general setting that we have, uh, I, I, will, I will always speak for, for, speak for uh, describing the basic idea, I will speak about only one variable, but all of this can be extended to n variables in general, okay? But in order to explain things, it's much better to think about a single variable at each moment. So we have one random variable, and then we have a probability uh, mass function or density function, depending on whether the variable is, is discrete or continuous, which is associated with the, the random variable. Then we have one or more parameters that are unknown. Uh, but this is an important thing. In the frequentist approach, in the frequentist approach, the value, uh, the parameters is assumed to be a fixed quantity. It is unknown, but it is a fixed quantity. It means that it makes no sense to define a probability distribution over the parameter. Uh, so the only thing that a frequentist uh, statistician has, the only way to, uh, that a frequentist statistician has to obtain information about the parameters is the likelihood function because it's a function that links data with the parameter. What is the likelihood function? It is just the joint density or the joint probability mass function of the sample, but considered as a function of the parameters. Let us assume that the data is fixed. It's not a random variable. We have precise data in our database. And now what, what we have here is a function that only depends, or depends on the unknown parameter. 
So this is a likelihood function. And uh, how does it work? So let's think about very, a very easy example again. In this case, assume we are, for instance, tossing a coin 50 times. And for some reason, we don't know what is the probability of getting tails or head. Let's see that the, that probability is an unknown value p. So the likelihood function looks like this. What I've written here is uh, the likelihood function when we get five heads and the 45 tails. Here, when we get 10 and 40, 25 and 25, and 35 heads and, uh, uh, and 15 uh, tails. So if you take a look at the uh, resulting likelihood function, you can see that actually, if we get five tails out of 50, then one might think that the probability of getting heads if you toss the coin is uh, five divided by 50, which is 10%, uh, 0 0.1, okay? And this is actually what the likelihood function is saying, because it is saying that if we take the more likely value, the, the, mode, the mode of the likelihood function, then we actually get the value of P that, max, that, that corresponds to what we would expect out of this result, okay? The same, the same happened here. We get 0 0.2, which is actually 10 divided by 50. And the same happens with the other one. So the likelihood function is actually a powerful tool. It's actually a powerful tool, but it's uh, not always uh, enough to, to, to answer the question that we might, we might be facing when we use artificial intelligence. For instance, a very simple question. Imagine we have this setting, uh, but we still haven't tossed the coin 50 times. We only know that we have a coin and the probability of getting heads is unknown. So if I ask you, I have this coin, the probability of getting head is unknown. Then I ask you, what is the probability that I guess that I, that I get a head if I toss the coin once? That's a very simple question, but frequentist statistics cannot say anything about that. Frequentist statistics can only say, I don't know, P is unknown. So before uh, I have a sample, I cannot say anything about the variable. So that can be a limitation. That can be a limitation, just to put a simple example, right? So uh, let's go to the Bayesian approach. From a fundamental point of view, from a fundamental point of view, the difference between frequentist and Bayesian approach is that in this case, the parameters are considered random variables too. Not fixed quantities, but random variables as well. So uh, you are very young to know this, but well, actually, I come from a, from a statistics department. So back in the 90s, there were like uh, two schools in statistics. One were the frequentist, frequentist statisticians and the Bayesian statisticians. And uh, for instance, in Spain, if you had to go to the exam for associate professor or for professor, uh, the, the examination board boards were chosen at random for all over all Spain. Uh, all over Spain. So uh, if the guys in your, I mean, if the majority were frequentist statistician and you were a Bayesian, then you had a problem. And the other way around, if you were a Bayesian and uh, they were, I mean, it was kind of problematic. But it wasn't the case when I went to the exam. Uh, so it was more or less solved. But back then there was like a fight and uh, a reviewer who was a frequentist would systematically reject your paper if it was Bayesian and the other way around. So it was something like that. As I said, uh, luckily it's not happening so much right now. And because of a rather philosophical question, it was a frequentist said that it's not possible that you say that the parameters is a random variable because it's a fixed quantity. You don't know that, but, but it is a fixed quantity. So it's not a random variable. But the Bayesian said, Okay, I admit that it's not a random variable, but from the point of view of uh, the practitioner, you don't know who's, uh, the value that it's taking. So from, in practice, it's the same as uh, if it was a random variable. So you can speak about the uncertainty or the likelihood of the different possible values of the parameter. So that's a, the real philosophical difference in between both approaches. So uh, if we uh, consider then the, uh, considered in random variables, then we can give some information about the parameters that is even uh, 
available before we have any data. And that's the prior distribution. And if you combine the prior data with the likelihood function that was used by the frequentists as well, then uh, you can get the posterior distribution by using Bayes rule. So that, that's the basic way of working in Bayesian statistics. We will uh, see with an example how we can do that. But uh, first of all, let's see the different distributions that we have in the when, when, when we are uh, following the Bayesian approach. We have the prior distribution that I said um, uh, before. Then we have, uh, I wrote there the joint distribution of the likelihood and the prior distribution. Then uh, we, we have what is called the prior predictive distribution. That this distribution would allow us to make or to give an answer to the question that I posted before. Before having any data, if we don't know what is, what is the probability of getting heads, using the prior predictive distribution, we could give a guess about what is the probability of getting tails if I toss the, to the coin once. Because this is a distribution that no longer depends on any unknown parameter. So it is fully specified because we are averaging over all the possible values of the parameter. Then we have the posterior distribution that uh, Arto already defined uh, in, the pre in the previous talk. And also the predictive distribution that also uh, Arto mentioned, which is obtained by averaging also over all the possible values of the parameters. In this case, averaging with respect to the posterior distribution. And this is the distribution that allows us to make predictions about one variable, given that we have uh, some data sample uh, available. Okay, so let's go uh, for an example, uh, because you already know that uh, how can be the posterior distribution, how can be computed. It's just solving this. Uh, actually, you need to solve this equation here, or actually do the calculations here. So is it really simple to do that? Well, it depends on how uh, good you are at maths. Uh, we will do an example here to see that it's actually possible to do in many cases. Let us consider one simple example where, again, we, we are tossing a coin and uh, we don't know what is the probability of getting heads or tails. But we are hypothesizing now that the probability of ge getting heads which is a uh, p is uniformly distributed in, on the unit interval. So what I'm saying here is that the prior is the constant function equal to one in all the intervals zero one. And do you guys think this is a reasonable assumption? So I had no. Why? Yes, yes, that's a good answer. I mean, you have no information at all about P, so you can assume that any, any possible value of P uh, should be equally likely to, to any other value. But uh, I also heard a no, and it may, might be the no, it's not reasonable, reasonable, because if you have a coin, perhaps the most sensible would be to assume that the probability of getting heads would be approximately 50%. And we are saying that uh, any probability of getting heads is equally likely to another probability of getting heads. So, uh, what the, the, what I wanted to 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 yes, so some something that would be more picked around zero point five. Yes. A what? Exactly, exactly. That's that's a point that is also connected with what you said. Uh, what I said here is uh, I did it on purpose. I said it's a uniform, but a uniform is actually a beta with parameters one and one. Uh, so uh, we, you can do the calculations that I've done here. 
actually you you will see that uh, what we get is a beta again uh, you can actually use any beta distribution and the beta distribution is able to accommodate almost any information for a parameter that takes takes value between zero and one so you can uh, depending on what parameters you choose you have very different uh, shapes in the in the prior density right very good so in this case i just chose a uh, zero one uh, uniform in the, on the interval zero one. First of all, because the calculations are <laughs> very easy, and uh, uh, also because uh, it's pretty standard. Because okay, you say yeah, maybe I'm making a, I'm making a mistake by assuming this, but then data will fix it, and we will see that in the example as well that we will run now uh, on the notebook. So let's see how we would compute the posterior distribution. First, first of all. We need the likelihood, which is this one. What I'm doing here is just to multiply uh, n times the, uh, the uh, mass function of the Bernoulli distribution with a known probability of success equal to p. And the result is this. Then pi is equal to 1, which is quite convenient because this pi goes, goes away. It's just replacing by 1. So the posterior distribution would be something like that. So the, actually, the only problem that we have usually when we are computing posterior distribution is the denominator. But then um, uh, mathematicians say that, uh, start, at least in my department, but actually my department is the math department, which uh, contains mathematical analysis, algebra, geometry, statistics, and applied mathematics. So it's a very big department with all the areas. And the uh, more math, let's see, algebra and uh, mathematical analysis people say that statisticians are lazy mathematicians. Why are we lazy? Because they would try to solve this equation, this integral, sorry. But uh, what do we do from in statistics and in machine learning? We think, okay, this looks very much like a beta density, but we don't have the constants. Is actually a beta density up to a constant. I've, if I integrate a beta density over the entire domain of the variable, I get one because if you integrate a density, you always get the constant one. So let's see what, uh, what is necessary to put here to actually get the, the density of the beta uh, variable with parameters, whatever. So you just put the constant here and then uh, multiply and divide by the same constant, and that's the trick that we do many times when computing mass distribution. So, that actually, this is what uh, my students do. Well, uh, some students do, some others don't for, don't remember this and fail. And uh, in the end, look at the result. What we have is that this is actually the density of a beta random variable with parameters. We have the one and the one that corresponds to the uniform distribution. And in this case, we have just added the sum of the obtained results. In this case, the number of uh, heads. And now we sum here the number of, this is number of heads and this is number of tails, okay? So it is very easy. Actually doing that is, doing that is very easy for, for some models. It is very easy for, for this model. If instead of having just the beta one one, we have a different beta, so everything would be the same and the result would, well, maybe a slightly uh, more complex because instead of a one, we would have the shape of a, the expression of the corresponding beta density. But in the end, we would obtain the same result. The only difference would be the, the value of the initial parameters of the prior distribution here, okay? So uh, in fact, do, by doing the same calculations, we can get, we can uh, learn that for, this combination of prior and likelihood models, then we can easily get the posterior. And when it happens that the posterior belongs to the same model class as the prior, then we say that both distributions are conjugate. I mean, the likelihood and the prior are conjugate. So uh, since the posterior here is a beta, then we say that the uh, Bernoulli and the binomial are conjugate distribution. But they are also the Bernoulli and the negative binomial, Bernoulli and geometric distribution, uh, uh, the Dirichlet and the multinomial distribution, the gamma and the Poisson, and so on. So uh, by 
doing the same uh, exercise that we did, uh, you can more or less, some of them are rather easy to obtain, some others are not so, for instance. Uh, well, I didn't put here the case where both parameters of the normal distribution are unknown. That case is not as easy to, to, to derivate, but you can actually do it, okay? So, but let's do in practice how it, uh, let's see in practice how, how this really works. So we go to the notebook again. and play a bit with this conjugate analysis for the beta binomial model. So what am I doing here? What I'm doing is to, first of all, generate a random sample from the binomial distribution. In this case, I put a probability of success 0 0.4. I generated a thousand points. And what I'm going to do here is to use different sample size, different sample size, and uh, see what is the prior and the posterior distribution that we obtain for a different sample size. Uh, I use five data points, 10, 50, 100, uh, uh, and then finally 1,000, which is the full sample that I've generated. And let's see the result that we get. The prior distribution that I've chosen is this beta 1, 1, which is the uniform distribution on the interval 0, 1. And you can see that it's not actually giving us uh, uh, any good information about the true value of the parameters that we are assuming that is 0 0.4, okay? But what you can very clearly see is that the flat distribution correspond to small sample values. And you can see that it doesn't matter how, how much data you have, but as you increase the number of data, the dis posterior distribution is getting closer. The mode of the posterior distribution is getting closer to the true value of the parameter, which is 0 0.4. And actually for the value, for the sample size 1000, you get a very good, uh, a very uh, precise information about the unknown parameter using the posterior distribution. And we can change here the value if you want, for instance, I don't know, Let's put 0 0.1 and run it again. And we should obtain the same value, the same uh, results, but now centering around 0 0.1, which is here, right? So you can see that how quickly it converges to something that is actually reasonable. Even though we started with a less informative, with a less informative value, okay, from the, on the prior distribution, then we very quickly, using the data, uh, we reach, reach a, good, a good estimation of the parameter. Okay, so you can play around. Uh, as you have a link to the, to the notebook, you can play around with the different values and, and do different tests. But the question is very good. You have, uh, you have uh, the way of doing things here, but what happens if we are not really following these uh, pairings? We are not sure that we have the appropriate uh, likelihood matching with the priors that we are using. Or, or why not use a different prior? It can be a different uh, density, none of this. Then would it, be still, would it still be possible to, to, to carry out this conjugate analysis? Well, in this case, it wouldn't be uh, conjugate analysis. I mean, the posterior distribution would be, wouldn't be of the same class. But then we would have to stick to, to some approximate way of obtain, obtaining the posterior distribution. It can be, as uh, Arthur mentioned, solved by using Monte Carlo methods maybe, but also using some other ways of approximating the posterior distribution. Um, but what happens with the other two distributions that I spoke about, the prior predictive and the predictive distribution? So we have the, I've done the calculations here, here too. For the prior predictive distribution, remember the prior predictive is perhaps one of the main differences with respect to the frequentist approach, because we can give an answer even if we, if we have no data. So look at what we get, starting, starting with the flat prior, the uniform prior. If we compute the prior predictive distribution, what we get is that that distribution is equal to one half for zero and for one. So even though it looked like that posing a flat prior was like assuming uh, or maybe being too cautious, when we compute the prior predicted distribution, we obtain the expected result. So it says that the probability of getting heads 
is one half. Okay? So in that sense, it seems that it worked. And also, if we try to compute the posterior predicted, let's say the predicted distribution, I put posterior between parentheses because it's not necessary. If you don't say posterior predicted, then uh, uh, if you just say predictive, it is uh, assumed that it is the posterior predicted, right? So what we get here is a function that only depends on x. It's a bit complicated, maybe, the expression that it has for, for this case. And this case is the <laughs> easiest one in the conjugate analysis. So it's sometimes not so easy to get a, the, the, the predictive distribution, but it can be done. Okay. But we, what you get is a function that only depends on, uh, of course, the data and the variable x. So using this distribution, you can obtain the probability of getting head and tails after observing the full data. Okay. Good. What we have done so far is what is called fully Bayesian approach. That is important because there are a number of terms that you will find when you read papers. You will you will read about this epistemic aleatoric uncertainty and some some some. Uh, well, you can always go to Wikipedia, and, but it's good that you know we know what is epistemic and aleatoric uncertainty. But now uh, I, I'm sure that many of you have uh, read this about fully Bayesian. Uh, approach uh, in the paper and you and you might wonder that's really fully be i mean can you be half married or can you be half Bayesian or no let's see uh, uh fully Bayesian uh just means that uh you compute the posterior distribution and then you use the posterior distribution for doing whatever you want but sometimes it's not necessary to fully compute the posterior distribution. You can compute it up to a constant. That's uh, what is called uh, uh, fully Bayesian. Fully Bayesian, you fully compute the posterior distribution. But uh, it might, might be enough to get, uh, uh, I mean, not to compute the denominator, not the denominator of the expression in the So we can just use this uh, numerator in this equation, this fraction, and also uh, obtain uh, sufficient uh, information for our problem. And that's the case that we are putting here. So instead of that, we only use a uh, numerator and then try to estimate the unknown parameter by maximizing uh, by maximizing the numerator or the, or the logarithm of the numerator. Does anyone know why, why I'm using the logarithm of the numerator? Again, because statisticians are lazy. Yeah, it's a uh, it's usually because uh, it's a monotone function, so uh, and we'll have the same extreme points as the initial function, and it's uh, usually much much easier to derivate to compute the derivative in order to maximize. So, uh, so if we do that, then uh, we are following what is called the maximum a posteriori approach, or we are. Uh, obtaining the maximum a posteriori estimator of the of the parameter, and uh, but we could also have uh, instead of use all these, just use the likelihood here. So just use the likelihood term, the, or, or the logarithm of the likelihood. In this case, then we would be doing exactly the same as uh, in the frequentist approach, where we try to estimate the parameters using the mode of the likelihood function. And this is what is called the maximum likelihood estimator, okay? So basically, there are uh, three ways of estimating the known parameters. The unknown parameters, one would be the fully Bayesian, maximum a posteriori, and also maximum likelihood. If you go deeper into this, then you will find that once you have the, the posterior distribution, you can consider different cost functions or risk functions and then try to find the estimator that minimizes the risk. Then uh, you can uh, it can be shown that, uh, for instance, the map is the result of using what is called a zero one loss. And uh, um, but you can also uh, define some other uh, risk functions and obtain uh, the corresponding uh, optimal estimators. Okay, let's go to the particular case of probabilistic graphical models now, which is quite convenient, as I said, when we are trying to, to obtain a probabilistic model that can be understood by people who are not experts on, 
on statistics and or in machine learning or in mathematics or so uh, I have this example uh, that I stole from Andres, uh, who is going to be the next the next lecturer. So if it's wrong, it's his fault. Uh, so, but assume that we have to we want to model a system for predicting whether a forest fire is taking place. That's maybe in Finland it's not so uh, likely that we you have a forest fire. But now it's starting to be a problem. I mean, in summer, it's a problem in Spain or in California, for instance. So uh, we want to have a model that tries to or accurately predicts whether there's a fire or there will be a fire. And the, inf and the information that we have is only a set of sensor readings. Actually, we have uh, three sens uh, temperature sensors and one smoke sensor. And we have sensor readings that give us the information about the real temperature in the forest and the forest, the real presence or not of smoke uh, in the forest. And we want to know whether there's fire out of that information. So this is a way of representing this problem. But in fact, the same information, if we did not consider this graphical structure, in fact, in fact, uh, we could represent exactly the same information just by having a joint probability distribution over all these variables. If we have this joint distribution specified, then we can make any inferences about the probability of having a fire, taking into account that we have the readings corresponding to T1, T2, T3, and S1, okay? So the goal is to predict the value of value, uh, variable F, fire, given that we have information on T1, T2, T3, and S1, but we don't really have information about the real temperature and the, and the real uh, uh, smoke that we have in the, in the forest, okay? The good thing about the uh, Bayesian network, the probabilistic graphical model that we have, we have here, I will define formally it uh, in the next slides, is that we, instead of specifying this very joint, very large distribution, we can specify much smaller distribution. That's what I said to you before. We can specify a small distribution that are easier to estimate. Uh, why? But because the structure tells us what are, what are the independencies between the variables in the model. And according to those independencies that we will see how it is encoded, then you can factorize the joint probability distribution as a set of smaller distributions, as I said. And if you take a quick, uh, uh, careful look at it, then you might see that there's one probability distribution for each variable. There's one for T1, another one for T2, for T3, for S1, for T, for S, and for F. And you can see also that each variable is conditional, the, each distribution is conditional of its parent variable. There's only one parent variable for T1, which is T, so we have a probability of T1 given T and the same for the other variables, okay? So it's a very easy way of specifying uh, probability distributions. But then uh, one might think, okay, but what is the meaning of the structure? Is this meaning that one variable is a cause of a child variable? I mean, is this representation a causal representation? Well, the answer is that it can be, but not necessarily. So it is possible to analyze or to build probabilistic graphical models so that they are actually causal models. And there's a lot of research now on that, uh, but not necessarily, not necessarily. I mean, you can obtain exactly the same distribution you can ex uh, obtain exactly the same distribution with different structures. I mean, for instance, uh, instead of doing this, I could uh, re reverse these two arrows and get the same distribution. Well, not, not these two arrows. I could uh, just, see, uh, let me put an example. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I could uh, just revert this arrow and obtain exactly the same distribution and invert this arrow and, and obtain exactly the same distribution. I mean, there are many structures that are equivalent in terms of, in the sense that they are able to represent exactly the same distribution. So in that sense, 
probabilistic graphical models are not really causal models, but they can be learned in such a way that they are really causal models, okay? But let's forget about causality. I, I will not speak about causality anymore in this lecture. Uh, I'm more interested in uh, efficiency and in modularity, because modularity is what is helping also build models efficiently. And assume that we already built our models, but then we buy new sensors. For instance, we buy a new sensor uh, for smoke. And also, we try to consider one more variable that might be important for predicting whether a uh, fire is happening or not, which is the season. I mean, if it's a summer or springtime, then it's much more likely that there's a fire, forest fire. And also, we included, as I said, this information about an, uh, one more sensor reading. Then the good thing is that we can reuse all that we had here. We only need to estimate the parameters of these new distributions in red, which are actually the distributions that are related with the new variables that we have included. So probabilistic graphical models in this sense are quite modular and easy to, 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 uh, to expand, which is, or somehow facilitates uh, the distributed treatment of, of uh, this kind of probabilistic models. But formally, what is a, what is a probabilistic graphical model? And more precisely, what is a Bayesian network, which is the, perhaps the most popular kind of probabilistic graphical models? A Bayesian network is a, just a pair of a set of random variables uh, uh, that corresponds to the vertices, uh, vertices of a, an undirected, uh, uh, of a directed acyclic graph. And uh, uh, this is on the one uh, hand, we have the, the DAC, the directed acyclic graph, and then we have a set of local conditional distributions, one for each uh, variable in the graph, okay? Then every Bayesian network encodes a joint distribution just obtained by the as a product of all the local conditional distributions in the network. And how can a network structure be interpreted? Just by using this uh, or knowing how to interpret these three, these are the three legal pieces uh, uh, that I mentioned to you before. So it can be shown that any directed acyclic graph can be built just composing these three kind of pieces. And uh, the three of them can be interpreted in this way. When you have a serial connection or a diverging connection, which, is, uh, which are these two cases, then it means that if you know the information, the value, you know the precise value of the variable that is marked in red, then the other variables become independent to each other. So if you know what the value of V is, or B is, then the value of A is not telling you anything about the possible value of C and the other way around. And the same happen here, happens here. If you know the value of B, then the value of the other variables do not affect one another. However, if we have a converging connection and we know the value of A or any other variable that is below A, then these variables become dependent. While if we don't know the value of A or any other variable below underneath A, then these variables are independent. In this case, if we don't know the value here or the value of here, then these variable variables become dependent, okay? So you can really know when, for instance, giving a pill to a patient can, be, can have an influence on the outcome or, or in the progress on the disease or something like that. Uh, and also you can know that if you have done something else, I mean, if you know the result, I don't know, of a blood test, then it doesn't make sense to use some other diagnose measure in order to predict the presence of a disease or not, okay? So a doctor can be easily see, okay, what should, should I do if I want to uh, know the value of this value, variable or whatever? If, we, if I want to know the value of E, and I also know the value of B, does it make sense to order a new blood test, blood test or something like that? Maybe not because what is the model saying that is it, it doesn't matter the outcome of the blood test, it's not going to change the probability distribution on E. So that's a way of interpreting, that's a way of interpreting uh, a Bayesian network. If we go back to the fire example, what we can see here is that if we don't know if there is fire or not, then of course, the temperature and smoke are dependent random variables. Why is that? If we don't know if there are fires, 
they are dependent random variables. While if we know that there's a fire, then smoke and temperature are independent. It could be an explanation could be yeah, that if we don't know, if we don't know that there's a fire, but we know that there's smoke, then we can presume, we don't know for sure, but we can assume that there's a fire and therefore the temperature will be high. However, if we know that there's a fire, we don't care anymore about the smoke because we, because we know that the, what is really causing the high temperatures is the fire. So the smoke is not adding any new information. So that's a way of uh, interpreting. Uh, the same happens with the real temperature and the sensor readings. If we knew the real temperature, but we will never, we can never know the exact temperature in the environment. We only have readings for, from thermometers, right? So, but if we knew the real temperature, then we wouldn't, wouldn't need the re sensor readings because we have the information here. We have a, a serial connection. But since we don't know this, then the sensor reading is actually affecting the probability distribution of variable fire, okay? So now we know how to interpret uh, the value or the, the structure of a Bayesian network and using that uh, important uh, knowledge that we have about the three legal pieces, we can see here, for instance, if we consider this uh, Bayesian network, uh, assume that we have information on this variable and this other variable, sorry, we have information on this variable and this other variable. We have information on M and on B. Uh, then we can see that information cannot flow through the parts that are marked here in red. Why? Because we have a converging connection and there's no information below it. So this variable can't, uh, these variables are independent for, to each other. Uh, the same happens here. But however, here we have a converging connection, but we have information about this variable. So these two variables are dependent rather than independent. So information is really flowing here. So for instance, if we had some new information about A, this information would be affecting D, H, K, I, E, C, and F, okay? However, if we had information on G, it would not be affecting any, uh, any other variable in the Bayesian network because it will be blocked here. Okay, so just using these three basic rules, we are able to read out the independencies just out of the structure. And take into account that we are not really looking at the numbers inside the probability distribution. It doesn't matter the numbers that you have. It will always hold, regardless of the uh, estimation of the parameters in the conditional distributions. The same happens here. Where you have the slide, so you can check this example just to play and try to see if you're able to to uh, able to to read the read of the, the independencies. Now the the key thing, the way of reading is that green paths is where information is flowing, and red lines means that means that information is not able to go uh, through the red uh, red block. Okay. Now let's go. Now we know what a. Uh, Bayesian network is, uh, we have given a toy example. Now let's go to more uh, technically demanding examples. But now again, start with the very simple ones. And I'm going to try to represent a Bayesian approach to the coin tossing example. Uh, I, I'm going, sorry, I'm going to try to represent it uh, using a Bayesian network. How would we do that? Well, remember that uh, I said that in a Bayesian, in the Bayesian approach, the parameters are random variables. So what I'm doing here is to include non, not only variable x, that would be the result of tossing a coin, could be zero or one, depending on whether it's a tail or a heads. So we have this variable, but we also have the probability of getting tails represented as a random variable, okay? And uh, in this representation that I'm using, you will see that there are things that are inside circles and some other things that are outside circles. Circles. If it is inside a circle, then it is a random variable. If it is outside, then it is a fixed quantity. This n here is the number of times that I'm tossing the coin, okay? And here, what is this? Well, I have included one more variable here that is indicated, indicating whether uh, the, the, the coin is uh, biased toward 
uh, tails or not, right? Somehow uh, trying to model whether the variables is uh, unfair or is uh, unbalanced or something like that. So I represented that by using one uh, extra variable. And if you look at this uh, representation, you might have noticed that this is a gray background and white background. The gray background means that we will have data. We can have data about this variable, but we can never have data about these variables whose background is, whose background is uh, white, okay? We will never have data about the parameter. We will never have in the sample probability values. We will have the result of tossing the coin. And we will never, of course, have information telling us whether the coin is uh, balance, uh, balance to, biased towards tails or not, okay? But what we know is that if it is actually biased toward, towards tail, then the probability of uh, getting head will be lower than if it is not, okay? And this uh, phi value here would be, uh, I, I'm assuming that uh, we know exactly what is the probability that uh, initially uh, the, the, the coin is uh, biased towards tails, okay? So we could represent this uh, using this Bayesian network structure. So if you look at the, if we try to read the independencies, then we find that X actually is influenced by the value of T. I mean, the result of tossing the coin, of course, will depend on whether the coin is biased towards, towards tails or not. But if we managed to know exactly what is the probability of getting tails or getting heads, then we wouldn't be actually interested about knowing about T because we have all the information that we need here. In this case, as we are not able to get information here, then information can flow, okay? Right. Let's go to a slightly, a slightly more complicated uh, example. In this case, we are tossing two coins. We are tossing two coins and we are assuming that, again, the probability that each one of them is biased towards tail is uh, uh, modeled by this random variable here that can't be observed. So that would be like uh, two, uh, taking two uh, coins from a bag. Uh, we don't know they can be biased towards sales or not. Then we to take two samples. Then the probability of, uh, depending on whether the, the two um, coins that we got were biased or not, would affect what is the actual probability of getting heads. That would be theta one and theta two. Then we toss n one times the variable, uh, the coin number one, and n two times coin number two. That would be, would be represented by a Bayesian network like this. Okay. Um, but let's think about another basic example that is related with the things that we have commented before. This is what is called a naive base, a naive base uh, classifier. A naive base classifier is a very very simple Bayesian network where we have one variable y that we want to predict from a set of features x1 to xk, okay? So we have uh, some, uh, we have k features that we can observe and we want to predict the value of y of, uh, from the value of those features. And we are assuming that y is a discrete or categorical random variable, okay? So, uh, what uh, I'm saying by representing this problem as a Bayesian network, and after all, representing this problem as a probability distribution, is that I can use the conditional probability of Y given the features to predict the class value for Y. When I asked, asked you about regression, then you, uh, some, uh, some of you said that we could use the expected value or the mean to predict uh, why, what could, could we do here? Now we have a discrete or even categorical random variable. So how would we predict the right, or how would we predict the class value? Assume we have class A and B. So, so uh, how could we use the conditional distribution in order to, given the features, predict the value for Y? Now we cannot say the expected value because we have a categorical Variable, okay. This one reminds me of, uh, I don't know if I should say this or not. Uh, 
okay, many years ago, uh, I mean, in statistics, we work a lot with doctors. So you get the, the probability for category class A and probability for category B, and then get the category with the highest probability. Good. Yes. But what I wanted to say that sometimes we, you might, I, I was thinking about, I was uh, speaking about non expert understanding statistical models. And there was a funny thing uh, working with doctors. Uh, if you work in practical medicine doctors, I mean, uh, physicians. Uh, so if you, in the future, you work with, uh, you will have the chance to work with doctors. And it was very funny because many years ago, it was in the 90s, then one doctor came with some data. Uh, to to our department and say, ah, I need help. Okay, what do you want to do? I want to obtain this information out of the data. First of all, some descriptive statistics. Uh, one of the variables was sex of the patient. And one of the things he wanted to obtain was the average sex. <laughs> but this was a qualitative variable and we tried to explain it, but in the end, he didn't understand that it's not possible to yeah, that's another thing of uh, speaking different languages. Uh, in connection to that, in, uh, maybe all of you know uh, Kevin Murphy's book about uh, machine learning, a probabilistic perspe perspective is called. Uh, in that book, he says, he, he claims that probabilistic machine learning is, is uh, convenient because it speaks the same language as some other sciences. In that sense, I don't know if uh, probability is the language for medicine, or even if medicine is a sign of. I mean, I mean, sometimes we think that every scientist will, will understand probability, but it's not always the case. It's not always the case. Well, I think Kevin Murphy was mainly thinking about physics, for instance, where they are really used to work with probability. And actually, variational inference actually has uh, been developed quite a lot in physics and uh, Monte Carlo methods as well. So. Yes, so well, we can use this very simple model to, to predict, to predict uh, the value of y. And it really works, we're finding many applications, right? Uh, but it takes us to some other things that you need to know when you read paper for your thesis. You, I'm sure you will find this discriminative versus uh, a generative model. So what is the difference between a generative and discriminative models? Because sometimes you read the paper as a generative model, okay, and you go, but in, deep inside you, you don't really know the difference between things. Well, I think that basically the difference is whether you're, the model that you are obtaining uh, allows you to generate new, sam new sample points. I mean, allows you to generate new data, let's say, new uh, synthetic data. If the model allows to do that, then it is a generative model. Uh, otherwise, it is a discriminative model. If you are using it to predict, I'm speaking about predictive models, okay? So you want, uh, you build a model to predict the value of y, y can be discrete or continuous, or continuous. but if the, if the model that you use is not only useful for, for predicting, but also for generating new examples, new synthetic data points, uh, then it is a generative model. So in a generative models, what we do is to learn the joint distribution and then compute the, the, the conditional distribution of the variable that we want to predict given the data using base rule, okay? Um, from a discriminative model, we don't learn the joint distribution. Instead, we directly build the conditional distribution. So what are examples of uh, generative models? The naive base models that we are seeing in the previous slide is a generative model because you can really sample new values for all the variables in the model. But any Bayesian network in general uh, is a generative model. However, I, we will see later that it can be a bit tricky and you can even have a Bayesian network that is not generative. I, I will try to put a, an example to, to, to illustrate that. And what are typical discriminative models? Neural networks, logistic regression. They are models that uh, can be used for prediction. They are very accurate models, but you cannot generate new uh, data points from them. So they are discriminative models. What is the advantage 
And uh, therefore, what are the pros and cons of each one of things? Well, the, the main pro of uh, discriminative generative model is what I said. It can be used to generate synthetic data. For instance, to generate these images from written description, which is a quite nice application. But the problem is that they have higher asymptotic error, asymptotic in the sense of error after learning with a lot of data. So if you have a lot of data, you, get, you can get more accurate uh, models using uh, the, the discriminative approach. But on the other hand, uh, it was shown some years ago that even though the error here is higher, it is uh, achieved more quickly. So if you don't have such a big sum, a large sample, then perhaps a discriminative uh, a generative model can be um, even more accurate than the discriminative one. For instance, a, a naive base for small samples can be more accurate than a neural network and things like that. And actually, in many practical applications, I mean, with real data, not big data, but small data, then you find that uh, it really happens that using a Bayesian network is uh, not only giving you information about the structure of the problem, but also it's producing more accurate predictions than using neural networks, for instance. Um, so, what is what I wanted to do? So this is ending on, at 12.30, right? The lecture at 12 or 12? 12.30. And it is 20 to 12 now, right. So uh, uh, what I'm going to, I have already used uh, this representation with the white and uh, gray backgrounds in the circles, in the notes. But I will also introduce what is called the plate notation which you are going to use very much during the, this, uh, this week. Uh, and the idea of this presentation is to avoid repeated uh, structures. For instance, think about this very easy example. We are, well, what, we are, what we are representing here is just a sample of variable x or n, uh, a sample of size n of one variable. For instance, uh, the result of tossing the coin with probability of getting heads equal to theta. So if we, if we throw it n times, we could represent the corresponding model here. But uh, there's a compact way of representing that, which is called the plate notation. This is exactly the same model as this, but the only thing is that we enclose into an oval node all the nodes that repeat or, or, or the substructures that repeat uh, a given number of times. So we have to somehow index the repetitions and say uh, the index range inside the structure. So that would be the, uh, let's say, the easiest possible example. But now we will consider a few more um, examples of plate notation and also take, take the opportunity to introduce some predefined Bayesian network structure that are able to solve uh, quite common problems in machine learning. Okay. Sorry. The first one is a linear regression. But what I'm trying to do in this slide, remember that I said, okay, we showed that, machine, uh, that linear regression can be seen as a machine learning method. But I said that uh, the approach that we follow in the example wasn't a probabilistic approach. We weren't using random variables. But I promised that we would be able before the end of the lecture to formulate the same problem uh, uh, or the same the, the, the regression model that is fully probabilistic. That's what we are going to do now. And we are going to use to do it using the graphical representation of a probabilistic graphical model. So uh, I'm directly using plate notation here. Um, I've also put the unfolded, let's say, or not plate notation. But in fact, we would need a lot of repetitions here. I use the, the dot, dot, dot to indicate that we have one y1, y2, y3. So we would have to, to, to represent n times this uh, same structure a lot of times. So we can compress the representation by doing here. And before looking at these uh, ugly equations, we can just look at the structure. What is uh, what, I, what we are saying here? We want to predict variable y and uh, see that this is a gray background. So it means that we have data that we will learn from. We will learn from data, uh, from observations about variable y. But then I put the variable x here. But I put it 
outside any circle. So I'm saying the data is not a random variable. So we know what the data uh, values for X are. We are not considering then random variables. Instead, I'm considering that what is a random variable is the parameters of the linear regression models. Actually, the underlying model is this thing. I'm uh, representing Y as a linear function of X. That is modeled by two parameters, W0 and W1. This uh, bold face W is actually a vector containing W0 and W1. And I've also included some random noise here. This random noise is actually a random variable, but cannot be observed. Okay, You will never have information in the data about this random uh, noise. So look at what we are doing. We have a conditional distribution for y given the parameters. But we don't have a conditional distribution, given, sorry, given the parameters and the data, okay? But we don't have a distribution for the variables, uh, for the variable x, okay? So what does it mean? Well, in fact, what we have is this thing here. We have the conditional for y given w and x, okay? Actually, we are assuming this underlying model, and this is a random variable, a standard normal uh, random variable, and Ws, I'm assuming that the weights, I mean the parameters, are also normal variable, Gaussian variables with mean zero and uh, standard deviation equal to one, okay? I've actually used the matrix notation here because you can have more than one uh, feature variable, okay? But let's think about a single variable so that we can understand it more easily. But then the question would be, is this a generative or a discriminative model? What do you think? It's a Bayesian network or looks, looks like a Bayesian network? It's a Bayesian network, so is, is it generative or discriminative? Generative? Seems generative, okay. But then I ask, if, if our data is X and Y, how would we generate values for X using this model? We can't. We can't. So it, does it really mean that Bayesian network can be discriminative and not generative? No, Bayesian networks are generative model. That the difference is that I, I didn't include this as a random variable. I assume that they are fixed variables. So I'm not modeling. In this case, I'm not modeling uh, variable X. I'm instead modeling the weights. Okay. So in this sense, we couldn't obtain new examples of X using this model. But it is because I didn't include this uh, explicitly as a random variable. But let's go back. Let's go back to this, this very easy example, the naive base, and assume that y, instead of being discrete, is continuous. In this case, both y and x have gray backgrounds. It means that I am modeling them. Uh, uh, sorry, both of them are inside circles, so it means that I'm modeling bo both of, uh, y and x as random variables. So in this case, that would be a generative model, or a generative model also for X. Okay, in this case we could do this. Actually, you can also define a, a regression model like this. You can learn the joint distribution of all these variables and then predict the, the variable of Y using the conditional expectation of Y given X. Okay, that would be somehow like a non-parametric regression model, or something like that. So you're not explicitly assuming that there's a line, a regression line or something like that, but you are actually estimating the joint distribution and you use the conditional distribution to predict the value for Y, okay? And actually it has been employed in some papers, this kind of uh, regression models were. So, but this is where we were. Uh -huh. Yeah, we have been able to formulate in a fully probabilistic way. So uh, is this really useful? Is this really useful? Yeah. I think it is. Why? Because Arto said that, which is really important, is that we are able to 
handle uncertainty, to quantify uncertainty. And he said that the posterior distribution contains all the information about the uncertainty, and that's true. The good thing here is that we are considering that W0 and WU, W1 are random variables. So uh, if we want, we, we, if we really want to uh, build the predictive models, what we have to do is to compute the posterior distribution on the parameters and then use estimates out of the posterior distribution, maybe the mode, the map approximation or whatever, to obtain a value for the parameters. Then we can predict why, okay? But we have, since we have the full posterior distribution on the parameters, then we have information about how certain we are about the estimation on the parameters that we have made. So it's actually quantifying the uncertainty. We were not doing that in the very naive uh, initial regression model that we built in the, at the beginning of the class, okay? So, uh, we will see another, uh, we have another, we have another example in Python uh, where we solve this regression model and we can uh, play a little bit with it. But uh, it could even be possible, it would be, actually, this can be solved, solved analytically. But in the general case, it's not easy to obtain the posterior distribution. Actually, here, it starts to be complicated. You have to play them with the multivariate normal. But there's a very easy way of solving the problems uh, that are related to uh, computing the posteriors, and it is using Monte Carlo. Uh, basically, in, during this week, you will learn a lot about variational inference. Uh, but in some cases, Monte Carlo can be very useful. And the good thing is that it is very easy. Sometimes it is very easy to, to apply. So at least maybe it's not as accurate as rational inference, but uh, maybe to get a first idea of what's going on, using Monte Carlo can be a good idea to understand the problem that we are facing. Um, and also, uh, we'll see that there are two alternatives. One is Marco Chain Monte Carlo, and the other one is important sampling. Mostly, Mar Marco Chain Monte Carlo is used. Uh, uh, in the papers that you will read, I'm sure. But important sampling is also typically a lot easier to apply and can serve uh, as a good, good way to explore at least initial solutions to, to our problems. So let's go with another example. This is, a uh, look, um, what is called a factor analysis model. A factor analysis model is also a, uh, um, very widely used because, in fact, what, what you're trying to do is to compress information. So, if we, if you look, well, actually, I've put here a lot of uh, repetition of the model, but the, the simple case is this one: you have a set of variables. You have a set of variables. Uh, what you want is to obtain a compact representation of those variables. Ideally, you want to have the same information as, as these variables here, but with a lower, a smaller set of variables. So uh, it's like you are encoding, you are encoding your information. It's like building an, an encoder, right? So that you can use uh, in the future. So initially, you learn from data this distribution, and in the future, this is a generative model. So you could somehow try to obtain the sample again, but only using the information on, uh, encoded in the model. So that would be a way of, uh, for instance, generating new images and things like that, right? So uh, how does it work? It's just a simple model like this, where you have these variables that cannot be observed, and you have the, the observed variables here. So the thing is that how can you, can you get information about the uh, unobservable variables, the hidden variables. You define prior distributions over their parameters, and then uh, you compute the posterior distributions over them, just taking into account the data that you have about the observable variables, right? And this is the common way of acting in, Bayesian, in the Bayesian approach. And I would say that's a very particular opinion that I have, but... Uh, uh, when I speak, uh, especially uh, I had the opportunity to give a few talks about machine learning and big data for people are totally outside academia. And they, they once was in a, well, I don't know if you have this here, this is called data beers. Don't have data beers. Uh, people that give talks uh, about uh, data 
analysis or whatever or uh, big data and things like that while the other ones are drinking beer and uh, yes it's a, it's a very nice way of uh, yeah it's like or, or pint of science maybe you've heard about pint of science it's a similar thing where someone speak about science was one uh, while drinking beer so then in one data beer someone asked me what what, what do you really think has been a uh, because now big data, machine learning is all around. You can see every day in newspapers or if you watch TV, there are always mentions to deep learning, machine learning, like great advances. What do you really think has been the, why has this happened uh, in the last years? And uh, yeah, of course you can, you can say advances in optimization that have allowed to, to use variational methods uh, from large data sets yeah, of course, that's that's true. But I think that this, uh, the, the, the deep down, what I believe is that the change has been that while usually we were focused or artificial intelligence, machine learning statistics was, was focused on modeling the data that you could observe. Now we are more focused on modeling what you, what you can't observe. So it's more focus is put on that. And by modeling that, the hidden variable, we've been able to solve a lot of problems. For instance, here, you are able to compress information because you are actually modeling some maybe, uh, maybe some underlying mechanism that is actually determining how the information that you get about the X uh, is obtained. So you, you try to model what that uh, hidden mechanism is. And I think that's, that's the, it has been the real success of machine learning, both in neural networks, actually, that you're actually modeling the weights and you don't really have information about the weights, but also in graphical models where you have the hidden variables that are actually putting the focus on what you can't observe. And that's a very important advance, I think. And it's, it was like a paradigm shift, for instance, in statistics, in statistics, where people, okay, more and more, there were, of course, the hidden Markov models and things like that, but now it is taken a lot more seriously. Uh, how to do these kind of things. Right. Yeah. Another very, very uh, commonly used, uh, uh, let's say, predefined structure uh, for a Bayesian network is this one where we have only information, only information about some variable, but we want to uh, determine where the individuals or the data points correspond to one class or another. The, this is a kind of classification problem, but we don't have information in the data about the class to which uh, each record in the, database, in the database belongs to, okay? So we only have values for X, but we don't have values for Y, let's say. So we model that by including a hidden variable that would be the unknown class. That would be what is called a clustering problem, okay, or unsupervised classification. And more precisely, as we are modeling the distributions here as uh, for the observed variables as a Gaussian, whose parameters depend on the unknown, uh, unobs uh, on the hidden uh, class variable, then it is called a mixture of Gaussians. Then it is uh, this very simple Bayesian network where we include the parameters as random variables. So it can be easily represented as a, uh, using this uh, formalism, in the so probabilistic graphical model. And again, it's, it is quite compact because we are using the plate notation. If we had to unfold it, then it would be a very large Bayesian network, right? But uh, the message that I want to, to, to send with this uh, representation is that by formulating or modeling the parameters as random variables, then we unify the treatment of what can observed with the treatment of those variables that cannot be observed. And exactly the same treatment that we would use, whether these variables that cannot be observed are the parameters or are simply some other random variables that are uh, hidden by nature, like, like in, this, uh, in, in this case, okay? So we have a uniform treatment for this variety of problems, which is quite appropriate, is easy to understand, and also can be solved uh, efficiently because there's a lot of, there has been a lot of research on how to do the calculations for the posterior distribution in, a, in an efficient way, okay? So, but uh, going to that, uh, going to that issue. Yes, 
we first uh, I was wondering whether to go to the Python example, but not we first to have to to speak about this, and then we will finish the the, the lecture with the Python example. So uh, the thing here is that we need to solve the problem of computing, what is called the uh, a probabilistic inference problem, which is compute, basically computing the posterior distribution, but not necessarily posterior distribution on the parameters. It could be answering any question. So, for instance, I want to predict vari variable xi given the value of some other variable in the network xe. Okay, so how can we solve this problem by doing computing conditional distribution? We can use a brute force compute the joint distribution for our, all our variables and then marginalize out the variables that we are not interested in. And then we would get the, we would get the result that we need. What is the problem? That we, if we use brute force, then the size of the joint distribution can be just too high to be able to, to compute them in, in a computer. For instance, assume that we have uh, binary variables. If we have if you have two run uh, two binary variables, then the joint distribution would have uh, four probability values. Okay, two times two probability values. But if we have ten binary variables, then we would have two uh, raised to ten uh, probability values to specify. So they grow exponentially in the in the number of in the number of variables. So what alternatives uh, do we have? we have the alternative to approximate in various ways. We can approximate by sampling or we can approximate by using uh, deterministic methods. So uh, variational methods that you will see later today or, or later in this week, sorry, are deterministic methods that can be combined also with sampling methods, right? Um, but let's first see one possible way of doing exact inference. If, if you can do, that's another thing that you have to know. If you can do exact inference, then you just do it. I mean, there's no point in approximating if you can get the exact results. So in the context of Bayesian networks, if we have this, uh, for instance, this network with five variables, assume we want to compute just the distribution on variable x5, okay? Notice that we don't have this, uh, this information because the information that we have in the network is the distribution of x5, but conditional on x4, okay? We want to know the information, the distribution on x5, but unconditional, right? So the, the way to do that using brute force would be to obtain the joint distribution and then marginalize out all the variables but x5, okay? If instead of... Uh, computing the joint distribution, we use the factorization that is induced by the network, then we know that this joint distribution is equal to this product here. What is the advantage of having this product? Well, the advantage is that we can do the, sum the summations only, only where it is necessary. For instance, we only need to sum over x1 in this part, but not here. So we can do the summations locally and we are actually avoiding to compute the full distribution. For instance, if we do this, what we obtain is the in the next step in, in the next step is a similar formulation as here, but with one variable less. X one is no longer here, so we are uh, uh, reducing the problem step by step until we get something that only depends on X five. That would be the exact distribution for X five. Okay, but still the problem can be. Difficult. I mean, if the structure of the network is sufficiently complicated, then doing doing this can be also difficult if, if we have many, many variables. But uh, I wanted to put this slide because it, it gives some uh, insight on how the structure can help us to carry out inference uh, in an efficient way. So it's not only the uh, interpretability, what is uh, what really takes advantage of the structure, but also the efficiency in the calculations. So, but what I said, well, let's keep this. Uh, this is the formal definition of the very simple example that I put in the previous slide. But let's go to the interesting point, which is the, uh, uh, sorry, here, the approximation and also using Monte Carlo. I will not speak about variational inference because you will, uh, as I said, and I will also not speak about Marco Chain Monte Carlo. Uh, but I will speak about the easiest, in my opinion, the easiest way of doing applying a Monte Carlo method, which is important sampling. And you will see why. Uh, 
Um, so uh, the, the, both for important sampling and Marco Che Monte Carlo, the underlying assumptions or, or the motivation is what I've written here. So you really have that, in fact, the, net, the Bayesian network is a representation of a joint probability distribution. And actually, a probability distribution is just a way of encoding the information about uh, what was traditionally called a population. A population is, uh, we can understand the term population as all the possible values or all the variables that you are studying in your problems and all the possible, possible combinations of those values, okay? That is what traditional has been called population in statistics, right? Um, so, but the key point is that if we were able to have the full population, then there's no need to carry out any probabilistic modeling because we have already all the information and we could make any inferences basically by counting cases. So if I want to know what is the probability of x1 being or x being equal to zero, then we just count how many cases in our population we have where x is equal to zero and divide by the total size of the population, okay? So if we had all the possible information, there's no need to, to, to do probabilistic modeling. But that's never the case, actually, because many times we are handling infinite populations. Uh, so we will never have uh, access to all the data. So Monte Carlo methods operate just by drawing a sample of that population and then building a model using that sample that is uh, drawn uh, from the original population. But of course, of course, the sample is much smaller in order to be measurable, must be much smaller than the uh, original population. And uh, therefore, uh, what we are going to, uh, to obtain is always an approximate model. But for trivial cases, will be an approximate solution, right? So what are the, what are the key issues in a Monte Carlo inference algorithms? Uh, in my opinion, there are two things. One is the sample mechanism. How is that sample obtained from the original population? And then how do you construct the functions of the sample that I used to estimate what is called the estimators? How do you construct the function that will be used to estimate the parameters of the model? Uh, here is where, where we find the two main alternatives, important sampling and Marco Che Monte Carlo. The main difference between important sampling and Marco Che Monte Carlo is that what Marco Che Monte Carlo is able to sample from the original distribution, which is the same as saying that actually Marco Che Monte Carlo is drawing samples from the exact, the original population. However, important sampling draws samples from a different population, which is much easier to sample in general. So we said, okay, uh, I'm not able to sample from the original population. So I will take from a different population, but then I will try to solve, to, or I will try to compensate that by weighting each one of the items in the in the sample that I have obtained, weighting them with a with a what is called a weight that is trying to uh, compensate the inaccurate, possibly uh, inaccurate ina inaccuracy of the of the of the sample item. Okay, so I, I will explain what the fundamental idea of uh, of important sampling is the fundamental technical idea. And the fundamental technical, technical idea is to express the problem that we want to solve as the computation of an expected value. So if I'm able to transform my, pro my problem into computing the expected value of some function of a random variable, then I can use important sampling. And what does it mean to transform my problem into an expectation? We will see that we can transform many problems or, or uh, uh, I mean, prediction problems very easily into computing an unexpected value. So the key here is that we are able to do that. We can express our problem as computing the expected value, which is the, by definition, the expectation of a function of a random variable is just this. This P is the probability function for variable X. So if we do this very common trick, uh, for any mathematical course you are taking uh, in calculus, then uh, very frequently you just multiply and divide by the same thing, okay? So we do that. We include here one P stack. <laughs> Statisticians are very lazy mathematicians, right? Right. So uh, we include this uh, P star here. 
multiplying and dividing, so it is okay, as long as, of course, this is not never equal to zero. Uh, but what we have done actually is to transform this expected value. P represents the exact population. So we are assuming that it is difficult to handle. But we are transforming this into exactly the same problem, but now we are sampling for a different population, which is a popula population represented by P star. And instead of computing the expected value of this, we compute the expected value of this other thing. But this is easy to compute. I mean, we can do very easily do this. Why? Because we choose P star uh, as we want. So we can choose any P star. This would work. I mean, this line would be true for any P star, again, who is never equal to zero in the points where P is different, to, is, uh, different from zero, okay? So if we manage to do this, then we can approximate this expected value by using, for instance, the sample mean. If we use the sample mean, we obtain what is called the important sampling estimator of the parameter we wanted to estimate, right? So it's very easy. This P star can be as simple as a uniform distribution as throwing a, a, throwing a dice, basically. Out, out of throwing a dice, uh, we can estimate any parameters. Okay, so that's what I really like from, from, important, from important sampling. Another question is how accurate it is. And of course, uh, depending on how you choose P star, then it would be more or less accurate, right? So, but now, uh, as I mentioned to you before, that would, could be a good idea to have an initial uh, understanding of uh, how our problem is working. So if we are able to build at least an initial solution using important sampling, then we can... Uh, know how to proceed in the future, right? So uh, what I'm doing here is to put this very uh, ugly equation. It really means nothing. It was just to impress you, but no. <laughs> it's, many people use that trick. Uh, well, maybe not at your universities, but I remember the first class day in my university. I studied in the University of Granada, and it was 1988. And first day, uh, one guy from the fifth uh, year, but looked like a very old professor, especially I was 17, 18 years old. So he entered the classroom uh, pretending to be the professor and started to write very strange things on the, <laughs> on, the, on the blackboard. And it was something like this. So. And uh, yeah, it was a mathematical analysis, the, the first class. And I remember he put, also put the bibliography uh, on, on the blackboard. And uh, one book, where, uh, maybe you know this, this Demiovich, A Thousand Problems of uh, Mathematical Analysis. And he wrote something like A Million Problems of Mathematical Analysis, or something like that. And he said, if you want to have any chance to pass this uh, course, you have to do all of them. And so it was a very <laughs> large, there were like 300 students in the classroom, all of them like doing like that. <laughs> It was a, well, this is an uh, old school university. It's now no longer the same. Okay, so but what, what I want to put here is that this is something that we might want to compute from a Bayesian network. So how, what is the probability of some variable being equal to, I mean, we, we want to predict the value of variable x, y, given some data. Uh, perhaps we don't want to predict a precise value uh, the probability of a precise value, but the probability of the variable of interest taking value on an interval. <laughs> but the, the same thing applies, right? But if we use the brute force, we would have to solve this integral. If we have discrete and, con and continuous variables, then we have to integrate out the continuous variables and sum over the discrete variables, and then compute the normalization constant here, and also finally integrate the posterior distribution of x over the interval that we are interested in. What I want to show here is that we can easily formulate this problem as computing the expected value of some function, okay? So uh, if we write it like this, as the expected value using the posterior distribution of xi given xe of the indicator function on the interval, a, B, then you can easily realize that we are actually doing exactly the same thing as here, right? So, oh, good news. So we can answer any 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 question we can we can ask to a Bayesian network 
by transforming it, uh, it as an expected a computation of some expected value. What is the problem? The problem is that we don't know, we are not able to compute this conditional distribution. This is actually what we want to approximate, right? So what we do is to use a different one. It can be whichever we want and do the same trick as we explained in the previous slide, two, two slides ago. And finally, we reached that we can use an estimator of this in order to estimate the value that we are interested, in, right? How? But just by replacing this by the important sampling estimator that we mentioned before, right? So it's quite easy. It's quite easy. You can, we can just sample from P star and compute this thing here. Can, it can always be computed because even though we are not always able to integrate the joint distribution, in a Bayesian network, you can always evaluate it for a precise point. I mean, computing this estimator for this endpoint, while well, this G here is, I, I wrote G for the joint distribution in order not to be, not to be always right in the same. But we can evaluate this because we can go to the conditional distribution and the network and take the precise value and send inside the conditional distribution and compute the product of all of them. So that's very easy. It's linear on the number of variables. So no problem about computing this estimate. And also we can compute the denominator here just by using the same, the same procedure. It can be shown, I'm not going to do it, but it can be shown that uh, it can be estimated also using exactly the same sample. So you don't have to sample again to estimate this quantity here, right? Good. So important sampling is very easy, but it has a problem of choosing P star, but it has another problem. Uh, well, actually it's quite related with the, the choice of P star. And it's a, the, 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 in general, the problem is that you can get samples or items in the samples that are absolutely useless. Useless in what sense? In the sense that this weight here is equal to zero. It might happen that this is equal to zero. Therefore, you would be sampling items that are not really giving you any information that is used for the estimation, right? It can, for instance, uh, happen if, if you have two variables and it happens that the probability of you have a x1 is a parent of x2 and x1 uh, being equal to zero have, has probability 0 0.9. And then the conditional of x2 being equal to zero, if x1 is also equal to zero, is zero, right? So what I'm saying here is that if x1 is equal to zero, then x2 must be compulsory. It, it must compulsorily be equal to one, okay? So uh, on the other hand, if x1 is equal to one, then both values of x2 are equally likely. They have probability 0.5. Then uh, what would happen if we, for instance, chose the laziest possible P star, the uniform distribution? Then uh, the result would be that 50% of the sample would be discarded. They would, have, they, they would produce a weight equal to zero. So they would be useless. Why? Because one half of the point approximately would be x1 equal to zero, and uh, x2, sorry, yeah, would be equal to zero, and then x2 would be equal to zero as well, right? Uh, sorry, it would be impossible to have x2 equal to zero. So whatever, whenever we choose x2 being equal to zero, we will get a zero, a zero uh, weight, right? If instead we use p star to be P of x1 directly the original distribution 0 0.9 then the result would be that over approximately 90 percent of the samples would be discarded in this case so both choices would be very very bad right um, so let's see how can we apply this to solve our linear regression problem but formulate this as a formulate this as a probabilistic model so the idea here is that we have to compute, as, as I said before, the posterior distribution over the parameters, and it can be formulated in this way. Well, basically, we have uh, that we are modeling both parameters as normal variables. Therefore, the joint distribution will be a bivariate normal with some parameter mean vector and, uh, and, and uh, covariance matrix like this. So uh, in order to simplify, to simplify the problem, we, quite, we can assume, or we can choose a P star, P star that is just the product of three independent 
normal densities, right? One for epsilon i, one for w0, and one for w1. In this way, the problem is, uh, I mean, the sampling mechanism is quite easy, and we can see if it works, right? So what do we have to estimate, actually? Well, if we take into account that we can express the variance of the weights and the covariances, so the parameters here, we can express them as expected values in this way, just using the properties of the, of the variance and covariance, then it turns out that the, we only have to estimate expected values for W0, W1, for W0 uh, to the power of 2, W1 square, and uh, W0 times W1. But after all, it's only expected values. So all of them can be estimated using important sampling, right? Um, uh, and here, all the expectations sh should be taken with respect to P, the exact posterior distribution. But we are going to use important sampling. Therefore, instead of using P, we are going to use P star. And P star will be that very easy uh, product of three normal that I mentioned before. So the estimators would be the estimators that we have here. And this is what we have to implement if we want to solve this model using important sampling. And uh, Sorry, and this is what I have done in the Python notebook. And let's see how it works. Right, here we are. I will generate a sample of, uh, I don't know, 5,000, okay. And uh, in this case, I'm, I'm sample, uh, sampling new uh, uh, data sets between zero and three, right? Mm. And then I am also building a, or building the values for y in the same way uh, as we did before. Here I'm using that uh, w1 is equal to three and w0 is equal to one, right? So we have to define the prior for the normal density that we are going to use for W0. will be a normal with parameters A0 and B0. Initially, I've set uh, the parameters equal to 0 and 1. We do the same for W1. Then we set the sample. So in each iteration, we are going to use a sample size of, let's say, 1,000. This sample size is to the artificial sample that I'm using to estimate the parameters of the, of the posterior distribution, right? So let's go and see what happens. Well, what, what, what you have written, what I have written here is, the, uh, is all the formulas that uh, you had in the slide, right? And now I'm going to plot the result. And this is what we get. We have the points in this case between zero and three. And looks like very good approximation. What is the different lines that we have here? We have that the blue line is, is the uh, exact model. The exact model is uh, this one plus this one here. One plus three times x, right? Which is the model that we want to approximate. The green line is the uh, the model the model fit using uh, least square. So it, that would be the uh, typical way of doing linear regression, which is quite accurate. And the red one is the one that we have approximated using important sampling, right? So it first of all, of all, it looks looks like uh, the important sampling is the worst uh, approximation here. You are right, but as you take into account that we are simplifying the problem quite a lot. I'm using a p star that is very easy. If we used a more accurate p star, then we would uh, uh, we would uh, obtain better approximations. But anyway, I would I would like you to see this. If we use a smaller sample size. For instance, 50. Let's see what the result would be. Sorry. 
I changed the sample size in the wrong place. This is the data that we are using. I, I want to change the sample size we are using inside important sampling, which is here. Instead of a thousand artificial samples, assume we are using just 10 samples um, from P star. Then look at the result. Yeah, I have to run this again. Case. Where? Ah, the plot. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, now we have all the points and where's the important sampling line? Oh no, there was a there was an error here. Let's do it again. I see maybe the sample is too small and it didn't do anything. Well, I don't know where it is. Should be here. Ah, yes, 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 yes. I haven't run this, I think. Have I? I need to in initialize the parameters again. Well, I don't know what's going on. I'm sorry. <laughs> Should work. Actually, it worked. But I don't know what happens now. Well, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Should be here. There's no, I don't see the problem. It's okay. Well, you, you initially you saw the, that there was a red line there. <laughs> I wanted to to, and uh, what you should expect here is that by changing the sample size, then you would get a very bad approximation for small case, and for as as you increase the number of you increase the number of uh, or the sample size here, then you get a better approximation. And in the end, you would get something like what we have that we had the red line that was pretty close to the exact value, right? So, sorry about this uh, very unsuccessful example. And uh, now we are close to uh, finish. We could also discuss about. Marco Che Monte Carlo or Gib something, but we are not going to enter into, into the details here. But uh, the, the main advantage is that uh, as you are using the exact, you are using the exact distribution, then you are always sampling from the, 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 the original population. So in theory, the results should be should be <clears throat> should be better. What is the problem? It can what it can happen is that 
uh, or the, sorry, the problem is that the sample that you, you obtain is not formed by independent items. While in important sampling, all the elements in the sample are independent, in Markov chain in Monte Carlo, they depend from the previous one. So uh, it can happen that you are get stuck in some areas of the populations while, while you are sampling, right? Uh, you can find an example here. Uh, where you can find it, but for this very small Bayesian network, then it could happen that you obtain always the same sample or almost always the same sample if you are unlucky enough, right? But anyway, the good thing is, as I said, that if you can use Marco Chain Monte Carlo, then you have the guarantee that you are sampling from the correct distribution. That's a very good point. So, but still, you, you need to be able to estimate the conditional distribution. If you are going to sample from the original distribution, then you need to do more maths in order to be able to sample from, from it. So it's more in general, it's more difficult to apply than important sampling, right? But also in general, you would get better results. So just to sum up, we are, what I have time to, to the message that I tried to send you during this long two and a half hours for you is that yes, PGNs provide actually a well-founded method for or formalism for handling uncertainty. We have seen that in some way, both epistemic and, uh, and uh, aleatoric uncertainty can be understood from the point of view of probabilistic models. Also that from a Bayesian point of view, uh, inference and learning are connected tasks in the sense that you're estimating parameters by doing probabilistic inference. In other words, by computing the posterior distribution on the parameters. Also, we have seen how the Bayesian approach hand, handles uncertainty. You can start with a lot of uncertainty on the prior, and then by using the data you are refining, you are removing uncertainty about the estimation of your parameters. And then also another thing is that if scalability is really uh, important for your application, then using probabilistic graphical models is important because they provide a way of structuring the problem, but also you will have to resort to approximate solutions like Monte Carlo or variational inference, as you will, as you will see during this week. But also how a very good thing is that interpretability is a quite important issue and a very good feature of probabilistic models. And that was all. Thank you very much. If you want to make questions, feel free to do it, unless you want to go for the lunch very quickly.